All right, sweet. Our top-notch AV crew is ready to go, so we will get ready to rock here. Good morning. Welcome to Com Week 2022. Everybody excited? It's um. early, I know. Uh, so I promise these, these uh, excellent speakers will bring the energy this morning. So again, welcome. We are really glad you're here. My name is Eric Wilson. I'm one of the faculty members here in the Elliott School. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to, again, Calm Week and our session, It's a Sign of the Times, as aptly titled by our creative uh, folks in Shocker Ad Lab. So uh, what this, this session is, is a, uh, really, I want it to be a conversation and a chance for y'all to get to meet some really cool graduates and ambassadors of our program. In my opinion, there are no three better ambassadors and representatives are, of our program than the folks you're going to meet here this morning, and they did not pay me much to say that. So, <laughs> uh, anyway, these are just fantastic people who have done a lot of cool things in a relatively short time out of school, and they've all gone through some pretty big career role changes, and that's kind of the genesis of, of where we're going to spend most of our time this morning uh, talking. And again, please feel free to ask questions, because I, I really think this uh, I've got some boring old guy questions that I came up with here, but I, I'm guessing the stuff that y'all will come up with is probably more entertaining and probably more insightful. So let me introduce our panelists without uh, further delay. There's also, by the way, there's coffee and water outside. If you need, need that, you're welcome to step out and get that as well. So uh, I'll just start here closest to me and we'll work our way across. So this is Megan Carver. Megan is a 2019 IMC graduate from the Elliott School. She spent, uh, in, in school, she did admissions, at, at, did internships at it, in admissions and textron aviation. And then she spent four years in various roles at the Greater Wichita Partnership uh, in communications and leadership and community engagement. And then uh, starting this fall, she is now the National Program Officer for Leave for America. And uh, she can tell you a little bit more about what that in, entails in a minute. She's also a former PR SSA president. We've got two former uh, Public Relations Student Society presidents on our panel this morning. <laughs> so I'm mean, always excited for that. In the middle, we have Ricky Ellison. Ricky is the Director for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Wichita Regional Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Ricky spent about 10 years as a faculty and staff member here on campus, uh, both working in the Office of Admissions and then in the Sport Management Program over in the College of Applied Studies before uh, leaving about a year ago to go to the Chamber to lead uh, DE&I efforts uh, for, for the Wichita Chamber. Uh, Ricky has both an undergrad and a master's degree from mm -hmm. the Elliott School of Wichita State and was a proud member of the Shocker Bowling team. So, yeah. fun fact. Yes. <laughs> and last thing? but not least, we have Trace yeah. Hughes. Trace is an associate creative director for Idea Ranch. Uh, Trace has about 10 years of experience as a copywriter. If you're an ad agency nerd, you will probably know some of these names. He's worked in Kansas City at VML YNR, Sandbox, Barkley. Uh, as well as here locally at Sullivan Ignite and State, now known as Signal Theory. Uh, and he's also been on the client side as a writer with a tech startup called Storable. He also served in the uh, Air National Guard and, again, was another PRSSA president at WSU. And, uh, again, currently is at Idea Ranch. So uh, these, are, these are your panelists. And, uh, yeah, I'm just going to have you tell them a little bit more about your career journey, kind of what got you to where you are now, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into some questions. Uh, you don't have to go in any particular order. Okay, we'll just continue going down then. All right, okay. Sounds good. Um, like Eric said, my name is Megan Carver. I I don't think I realized how many jobs I'd had until Eric asked me to be on this panel. So that's <laughs> good reflection on my part. Um, so like Eric said, um, I'm an Elliott School grad. I decided to go into communications because I was involved in journalism in my high school and thought, oh yeah, I'm pretty good at that. We'll just see how, where that takes me. And my English teacher encouraged me to go through that. So um, I have journalism roots and then didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew communications would be broad enough that I would learn a lot and be able to do a lot of different things with my degree, but wasn't really sure what I wanted to do when I graduated. So made a point of trying out a lot of different things um, from just like freelancing, volunteering to finding different roles. And eventually found a great passion for community engagement um, with skills in uh, community engagement and then talent retention, attraction, and development. And so kind of have like this weird mishmash of skills. And when I was looking for a new role, I was so surprised to find something that actually mish mishmashed all three really, really well. So um, yeah, loving my new job as national program officer. I'm in about eight weeks-ish, seven, eight weeks, and really enjoy it. So my job is to... Um, help with our programs. So we are a launch pad for young people in, interested in a career in public service. And so we have a one year long fellowship program 
where we have mostly recent college grads and we help them um, with host site placement for one year um, and provide them with all the programming that they need and the support. And so my job is to oversee that program as well as mentor, empower, and support those young people across the country. So I have about 20 fellows that I oversee um, everywhere from California to Maine, Texas, and Montana, and everywhere in between. So again, my name is Ricky Ellison. Uh, I'm born and raised here in Wichita. And so one of the things that um, I'm classified as is a boomerang. So graduated Wichita State. Once I decide, well, once I graduated with my undergraduate degree, I actually took a job out at Delaware um, to be a women's head bowling coach. And so you can kind of see my, my job trajectory has been a lot of different areas. And it's funny how they kind of all come back together towards the end. Um, but so I was a women's head bowling coach for a number of years, worked for NCAA for a couple of years, and then missed the Midwest so much that I needed to come back to Wichita uh, and, and raise my family and enjoy Wichita life and all that good jazz. Um, so I decided to work here at uh, Wichita State. I have a passion for it. I have a passion for uh, our community youth. Um, so as you can see, kind of some of the themes already mm -hmm. is looking at what you enjoy on a day-to-day -day basis, what you're not only passionate about, but um, what excites you, what fuels you. And so through that, I learned that educating, teaching, um, awareness, bringing access to others was really the key pieces of that so I moved over into the sport management to build my combination of a clinical background of actually working in sport management and then bringing that into the classroom, which was a lot of the things that I did in the admissions office as well. Um, I was a diversity recruiter inside of the admissions office. And then now just uh, one year into the chamber life, leaving higher ed from being here from, I believe if I count my college, my uh, bowling, years, it would be about 14 years in higher ed um, in the professional working course to move into more of a business sector. Um, and so far, so good. I'm still there. <laughs> Trace Hughes, like Eric said, um, <clears throat> currently an associate creative director at local ad agency Idea Ranch. Um, kind of a interesting story is I've, I've almost been working for 10 years and I've changed jobs six times. Um, that's something I do frequently, but <laughs> uh, but it's been to, it's a great benefit too. But I got my start here at the Elliott School. Um, at the time, I was pretty lost. I'd just come home from a little stint in the Middle East and had to take time off from school. And for details I won't bore you with, one of Eric's uh, intro to IMC classes was a class, uh, one of the only classes I could enroll in that semester. And that's kind of where I started to find um, you know, call it purpose, or at least direction at that time, uh, a light bulb went off in terms of interested in something that I'm also maybe decently talented at. And so I made a decision to just focus on advertising, specifically copywriting. So <clears throat> that led to a relationship with SHS here locally, which is now Signal Theory, which is funny because there's only two companies I've worked at that have not changed their not changed their name. <laughs> I left SHS for Brothers and Company, which is now Idea Ranch, where I currently work. So I, I'm a bo boomerang in that sense. Yeah. Um, from Brothers and Company, I moved to Kansas City to work at Barkley. And they're still Barkley. From there, I went to a, a smaller agency called Two West that then became Sandbox and is now Merge. And from there, I went to VML, which became VML YNR. Um, while I was there, and uh, I left that to go client side um, for a, a software company based out of Austin, Texas, that had a Kansas City office. They were called Storable, um, and then found my way back to Idea Ranch. So that's my that's the short of my roundabout career. So great. So I'll start out with a question or two, then we'll open it up for the audience. So most of you have been through multiple different iterations in your career. And so what are some indicators that it might be time to look for a different role within your organization or a different opportunity altogether? I'll go. I, I mean, I grew up in a small town in central Kansas. And so I played high school football. And there's kind of an analogy and it has to deal with like attention, um, you know, but it, when you're playing football and the, the coach is harping on you a lot, you know, when you're, you're young and, and form in your formidable years, it, you know, it's easy to kind of whine and complain about that. But, 
you know, then you're reminded it's like that, you know, attention is better than no attention, right? You know, if there's a, if there's visible signs of investment and encouragement, even if it's, you know, getting your butt ripped out for missing a block or whatever, um, you know, you, it was better to have your coach paying attention to you than not. And that translates into professional setting. Um, you know, if you feel like your ideas aren't being heard or if you're overlooked, constantly ignored, um, sometimes it's a gut feeling. Uh, sometimes it's also um, just your inse insecurities of which, you know, as a creative, I have many. Um, and so sometimes it's, it, it's of your own creation, but other times, um, it's probably true. Um, so if you feel like you're not being heard, you're not being invested in as an individual, if there's not, uh, you know, an interest in your professional development, um, that's a pretty good sign. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for example, when I was at Barclay, there was a, a junior designer that I knew and he had been there for three years and he and I were talking one day and, um, you know, he was kind of down. And so we were talking about that. Well, he had been asking for a raise for like 18 months and just kept getting, you know, this roundabout, you know, hey, we just, you know, we don't have the money right now, blah, 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 whatever. Um, so my advice, well, I mean, yeah, I felt, I felt bad for him. But to me, that's like a huge red flag um, in that instance. And it's like, okay, you know, that the way I would react to that and, and everyone reacts differently, but to me, that's a red flag of, okay, they're not invested in you. It, you know, if they, if they valued you as more than just a butt in a seat and somebody that can bill hours to clients, um, it wouldn't be this difficult to have those conversations and to at least get a little bump, if any, you know, so um, that's one example, but that's where, you know, the short of that, not to get too long winded is, if you feel like you're being overlooked, you're not invested in, or there's not an interest in your professional development, that could be a sign to go find someone uh, that will be uh, more interested in your growth. I agree. I think those are a really good explanation of the external factors of you know not feeling valued and your organization is not valuing you. I think there's a lot of internal factors as well. I think for me it was, um, I kept having these should questions come up. I should feel more invested in this work. I should feel like, um, I enjoy this. I should feel like I want to get out of bed for this every morning. And after a while, I was like, why do I keep having all these shoulds come up? Like, <clears throat> who says that I need to do these things? There are so many um, pressures from external sources that eventually I was like, why do I need to succumb to any of these? And then I started turning those shoulds into what ifs. What if I went somewhere else? What if I um, got asked for a new project? What if I um, had this out of the box idea and pitched it um, and just started to dream bigger. What do I really want for myself and my career? What do I not like about it? Um, and why do I feel those shoulds? Who's making me feel those shoulds? And then kind of setting those boundaries around that. Um, and then really opening up to what could be and why am I not doing that? What's standing in my way? And then moving toward that. And that's never steered me wrong so far. Yeah, it's definitely um, a gut feel. Mm -hmm. I, I truly believe in going with your gut 100% of the time. Um, I feel like it's never steered me wrong. Uh, while it may be scary and it's the unknown, so you're jumping into a basket that you don't know what the, what the bottom looks like, um, but that's okay. Uh, I think that it's always really good to remember that you have options. And not just in the climate that we have right now. Like, yes, we understand we are maxed out at... Um, at our market where there are two jobs for every one person. So yes, you have options in that sense. But even if we were in a tighter market where jobs were scarce, again, you still have options. And I think that that's the piece that um, we have to remember when that gut feeling hits us. Um, I, always do, I always do this in twofold. And so I, I like to think about my priorities as a person, as an individual. I look at things like I was not just put here on this earth to go to work. So my work is bigger than just this nine to five or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be. And so if my ultimate goal is to affect change in my community or it is to be able to go on a vacation, like it doesn't matter what the goal is, but you have to be able to prioritize what matters to you. Mm -hmm. And if that job no longer aligns to allow you to do that, if, if one of my goals is to make sure I can go to Disney next July and 
uh, my work now says that you can't take vacation in July. Well, I need to start <laughs> start thinking there may be it may be time for me to move around because this is my ultimate goal. I want to be in Disney in July. And I use that um, example because it doesn't have to be this big worldly thing. It can be just something you want to do. I want to be able to buy this particular type of car and this job working this way won't allow me to do that. So maybe I need to look around and see what other opportunities there are for me to do that and understand that right now moving around doesn't mean that you failed at one thing or that you're leaving them high and dry. You don't want to leave them high and dry. You know, allow them to have a plan of succession. So here's what the next person will be able to go with. Here's the next three months, whatever, end on a good term because you never know when you might want to circle back <laughs> and, and get a job with them again. Um, but but don't miss out on your opportunity because it was comfortable to stay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great, great stuff. Uh, and I want to follow up on something that Ricky said. So this is obviously not easy in most cases, even, you know, if it's maybe not a great situation that you're leaving as far as an employment, but it's not easy. So how do you deal with, or what are some things that you have found that have helped you deal with some of the fear and the uncertainty and some mm -hmm. of the, I guess, for lack of a, a better term, <coughs> icky feelings that come with mm -hmm. making, making a change? Yeah, I would say leaving. So for me, leaving Wichita State was incredibly hard. I had built a community. I had built... Uh, people who supported me. I had um, the folks who were investing in me to get to another level. I was in school. Um, I'm still pursuing my doctorate degree here. And so there are all these elements working. And so I'm like, I got this path going. But then a mentor intervened and said, hey, here's an opportunity where I think this will grow you even faster. This will stretch you in ways that you haven't been stretched, that you're not being stretched here now. And so I see something in you more than you see within yourself. And so in those hard times, leaning on mentors, leaning on your external support system really, really helps. Because, again, they see something in you that you don't see in yourself that will allow you to take those challenges and kind of jump off the deep end there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my, in my experience, and as a creative, who which Lee Clow describes creatives as 50% insecurity, 50% 50, 50 ego. Uh, and it's 100% it's true. And as that relates to my experiences in, in changing jobs, totally. um, it was hard, but also for me, I mean, one of the reasons is in advertising specifically, it, you know, there's this kind of joke, but it's not a joke, it's true. The only way to get a raise in promotion is to change jobs. Um, and it's very common practice, you know, the aptly, name session, it's a sign of the times. Um, if you get into a creative industry like advertising, you're gonna work with a handful of people, especially when you get into a bigger market like Kansas City, that move around you know, every eight to 10 months. Um, it's, it's what we do, um, it's what I did. Um, it, it's an easy way to get a good pay bump. Um, it's also you know, a way to kind of learn a lot of different ways to approach this business. Uh, and learn quickly, which has been a benefit. But uh, so back to, you know, the 50% ego, 50% insecurity. One of the reasons I would always, and sometimes it was because somebody would reach out to me because they had an opening. And sometimes it was because, you know, I'd, I'd had a bad day. And so I just start scrolling, looking for jobs. Um, so, and that's the insecurity part of me. Um, I've also had this, uh, it, I have waves of, conviction that I'm about to be fired um, at every job I've been at. Um, it's, not a, it's not a really depressing thing. It's actually been a, a good thing in terms of it just keeps you on guard and makes sure you bring in your best. But that's the insecurity. There's my 50% insecurity. I start looking because of, like, well, they're going to walk in with a pink slip at any moment. So let's get out ahead of it. And I'll break up with them before they can break up with me. <laughs> The ego side of it then is when you start engaging in these conversations and it's it's a recruitment process and it becomes a negotiation and um, it's kind of fun to feel wanted professionally. And so you get caught up in that. And I did a handful of times. And so that that's kind of the, a little insight into the moves I've made. Um, every time, you know, I've never, 
I've never felt bad about leaving a company or an agency uh, because there's no loyalty within companies. Um, I've felt bad about leaving people, specifically the teams I work with and, and the, the, the direct reports I had, my creative directors. Um, that's where the loyalty exists, especially in a bigger company. Um, and that was the hard part. You know, like leaving VML was, I, I could care less about VML as an agency. It was the team that I worked with for two years. Um, you know, that was always the hard part. And then, of course, the unknowns of, um, okay, now I got to kind of start over, prove myself again. Um, you know, but... I just, you know, you just kind of do it and you figure it out as you go is, is what I did. But yeah, the, um, that, that's my thoughts on that. Yeah, I think this is a safe space. So I'm going to take this as a moment for you all. Um, I left my last job without having another one lined up. I straight up quit and was unemployed for six weeks. It was on purpose. I was burnt out. I needed the time off. I just couldn't go to work anymore. I was pouring out of an empty cup and needed to take that time off. And I was privileged enough to be able to do that. I'd been saving my money to be able to take some time off. I wasn't really looking for a job during that time. I think someone had posted something on LinkedIn for Lead for America, and I was like, yeah, that, that's it. Um, I think I applied like my first week of unemployment and like kind of followed through the process and ended up being unemployed for about six weeks. But that was a really good decision that I made. I was able to go into a new company and a new role feeling refreshed, feeling energized, which is really what I wanted. And it also gave me the clarity that I needed to figure out what I wanted to do, because I really didn't know, and I didn't know how I'd be able to find another job that could mix my skill set well enough, and being able to find an organization that did value me and did invest in me. And I'm really happy to say that I found that here, or with Lead for America. So um, I think there is definitely, most definitely a fear element to it, but also knowing when enough is enough and figuring out a game plan. And if you're able to do that, do it and take the leap and bet on yourself because you'll find something even better. Great stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll just sum up a little bit. Invest in yourself. Um, know when it's okay to step back uh, and, and take time to care for yourself. Uh, and you know, and look for that culture that lets you grow and succeed. And and those are all I think great pieces of great pieces of advice. And you know, Wichita is a you know, it's a, and Kansas City to a degree as well are big small towns. I mean, you will. Uh, Trace mentioned the people, you know, you will find ways to continue the relationships with the people and you never know where you may end up in the same, you know, work environment again as well. So, um, you know, and, and I will just say lean on your people, lean on your relationships. Uh, it's, you know, that's, uh, and that could be professional or personal yeah. or, or a mix of both. And, and that's in most cases what will help you navigate those times. So at the risk, if any of you listen to Jim Rome on the radio, the sports guy, <coughs> where he talks for three hours about how he wants to take your call and then he'll take some calls in a three hour radio show, we're going to open it up. What do y'all want to know? And, and does anybody have anything that they want to know that's come up so far? Yeah. Um, so when you position like telling your employer that you're leaving can be a really challenging like, thing how have you found is the best ah great that's a good question so have you been hanging out of my head because that's one of my questions <laughs> so absolutely uh, just just for the audio feed and in case you didn't hear all the questions uh so the question is when you get that next opportunity or when you decide to take some time off for yourself how do you have that conversation with your your supervisor, your manager, what, what does that look like? And what are some things that have, have maybe worked or not worked in your cases? I was super honest with mine. And I already had a relationship built with my boss, most of my previous bosses, I would say. And so they kind of knew it was coming. I was having very honest conversations prior to that. I was like, I'm struggling, I'm burnt out. Um, and they would <clears> offer <throat> to help however they could. Where if that was like, do you need to take like some time off? Do you need to kind of figure that, figure out, take some, you know, whatever that might be. Um, and I was just really honest. So she wasn't super surprised when the time came and I was like, I, it's time, like I need to go. And she was very supportive of that. She really wanted the best for me. Um, but I would say honesty and transparency is 
is really the best, but also knowing that you don't want to burn those bridges either. So like Ricky and I used to work in admissions when I was a student assistant. And then I know where you're working at Idea Ranch, the partnership where I used to work is working with Idea Ranch right now. So like with, there's these connections that um, if I had burned any of these bridges, this panel would be super awkward. Um, <laughs> and, and I didn't. So it's really important to not build, not burn those bridges. So keep being honest, absolutely, and saying where they can improve. Um, is really, really important. Like saying, you know, going forward, I think this would have helped me stay longer, but um, so honesty, but also doing it in a way that's respectful to them, not doing any personal jabs and then just not burning, burning any bridges. Yeah, I would have to say um, having that sit down meeting with your supervisor is important. Um, follow up with the actual what is it called? Letter. Like what? a written. It's a written resignation, resignation yeah. letter. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. A formal resignation letter. Uh, I've seen too many times, I work a lot with a lot of HR departments, too many times that people get confused on when the actual last day someone is employed, what the requirements are going to be for them departing. And so being able to just outline that in a written document that says, all right, my final day in the office will be this day whether it, your final day of pay will be a different day, I'll be using the rest of my vacation, outlining all of the details for your departure. Here's gonna be the person who will have my passwords, contacts, whatever, um, if it's on a shared drive, here's where you can find the documents. Making sure that you outline that is so, so, so nice to your supervisor. And that's something that they will definitely remember. But when you have the sit down conversation, and I say have the sit down conversation before you send the, because <laughs> no one wants to just like open an email and be like, oh, they're leaving, okay. Yeah. Um, and so I would I would definitely have that conversation and say, hey, I, I need to have a conversation with you about my future here. Um, let's set aside 30 minutes where we can chat. And then again, that honesty of, you know, here's just not what's not working for me. Here's what I'm looking for in my future and it just doesn't align. Um, because what may actually end up happening in that meeting is there may be some negotiation. They may mm -hmm. be able to offer you some opportunities to stay that are things that you were looking for and that may entice you to stay. Uh, but don't go into it looking for that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah, don't don't go into that looking for that because that usually errs on the 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 worst side. Okay, so that's how I would say. I think every single one of those conversations I've had, that's exactly what they did. They came back and said, what can we do to keep you? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've come into those conversations before not having firm boundaries of what I was willing to do or if it was like, this is, this is it, like there's nothing you can tell me. And then also like well, how much wiggle room is there? So knowing what your boundaries are and being super clear on those because they will try to talk you out of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I agree with everything. Um, it, it's a really difficult conversation. And it's one of those conversations where people can reveal their true colors. So every, every con sit down conversation I've had around my resignation, except one has gone really well. Um, the one that didn't go well um, was somebody I'd worked with for a long time who ultimately became my boss and we were, we were pretty good friends. Uh, and he, I prob probably because of our friendship, took it very personally. Um, but he also just had a quirk of taking everything personally. Um, and so he had a really hard time processing it. I would say he didn't react well to it. And, and that's a, when it goes that way, it's easy to like look inward and maybe beat up on yourself. Like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do this. Um, I would set that aside because that's more of a reflection on them mm -hmm. and less on you. And in fact, you know, there, there's a spectrum of how bad it can go. Um, you know, I know people have been asked to just walk out the door. Um, when I, it actually was kind of unflattering when I resigned SHS. Um, I wasn't, you know, I gave them a two weeks notice, but I wasn't sure. I, I knew that some people that had resigned were pretty much said, okay, you're done. And so I got an awkward call the next morning. I was like, Hey, all your stuff's at the front desk. You can just come in and pick it up, but you're done. And it's like, okay. So again, that's a reflection on them. Um, you know, you, it's a situation where you control what you can control, which is how you react and how you leave. Um, always try to leave well. Um, 
you know, to Megan's point about not burning bridges mm -hmm. um, because you never know uh, when an opportunity is going to present itself. And sometimes, like in my situation with Idea Ranch, you know, I left because it wasn't a great fit for me at that time. Um, and so I was, it was about eight years in between when I was last there and now. And it's perfect for me now. And what, sometimes what you realize is or, uh, organizations have to grow and evolve, but then you two have to do that as, as an individual. So. Uh, and, and I will add just, and I've told this to interns and students, if an employer wants to give you a hard time about leaving, A, I, I hope that doesn't happen, but it does occasionally. I would say it's probably not the norm. A, you know, maybe they're caught off guard and maybe they're bringing their own baggage into it. Uh, you know, and, and maybe you're really leaving them in a lurch. But again, that's usually a sign that it may be not a great fit is if they want to make 100 percent on guilt trips or mm -hmm. things or make it difficult. And, and there are certain companies and cultures. Trace mentioned I, I worked in ad agencies for a while as well. It seems like there are some that are a little more competitive in nature and a little more secretive in nature than others. I will say that your steps at the front door is probably not the normal, you no. know, but there are certain lines of work where that may be more common than others. But, uh, but yeah, you know, if, and, and I'll just say, reach out to, again, reach out to your people. If, if a conversation doesn't go well, or if you're, you're worried about it, you know, people, faculty are happy to help. Uh, the Shocker Career Accelerator is a great resource on campus, other places that can help you be prepared to have these conversations. And great. remember that you are, once you've put in your two weeks, then you are technically a risk to the organization at that point in time. Um, and so if you look at it from that standpoint, I know um, at certain places, as soon as you put in your two weeks, they're like, okay, you're not coming back in tomorrow because you could do any type of things with accounts. You could, and they just can't risk that. Not saying that you would do that, but they just can't risk it overall. And so sometimes it's not even about you. It is about really the structure of the organization and what they need to do to protect themselves at that point in time. Great question. Other, yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, so you had spoken to this earlier, Megan. Um, yeah. Like the what, like the shoulds, the what if mm -hmm. aspect of it. But uh, just kind of going to that more further, when you're with an organization or at a job, and it's like mission driven or goal oriented, at what point do you recognize that what you believe and what you signed up for initially doesn't align with what they're trying to do now? You're, so you're asking when? Yeah. When you kind of tell that? Yeah. Ooh. That's that lead with the gut. Uh, yeah, exactly. Because your gut will be like, mm, that's a little questionable. I don't know if I if I am, am down with that. Mm -hmm. And then that's when, to me, you have to start asking a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where are we going? Create the picture for me so I understand what the end goal is. Because sometimes the vision gets lost in translation. And this is the cool thing about being communication students, right? So y'all understand how someone can say, one sentence, but three people take it three completely different ways, right? Mm -hmm. And so with visions of organizations, especially if you're looking at nonprofit community, you're having four different conversations at the exact same time, trying to get to the same direction. But if we all don't understand what the ultimate goal is, what our value here is, what type of impact we're trying to make, and what that looks like, that's when the confusion breaks down. So I always feel like if I start feeling like mm, this is going questionable, I'm not sure what we're doing here, I need to start asking some additional questions, some harder questions um, to the organization. Yeah, I think look at your organization's values, if they have them. Um, not all organizations have them, which might be a little bit of a red flag, but um, look at the values that they have and then look at the decisions that they're making and are they making values-based decisions? Like, are you are you living out what you said you were going to? And that can be another bit of like a, mm, something's kind of fishy here because you promised me these things. You said we were going to lead with these kinds of values, but then you did this thing over here and that these things are not adding up too. So if they if they don't have values, I think that that makes it a little bit tough, but some, oh, I think a lot of companies are pretty upfront about their values and will say, this is how we lead, this is how we make decisions. And then you can kind of go back and, and be able to say, hey, you guys said that, the, going back to the hard questions that Ricky said, you guys said you guys lead in this way, but you made this decision. And my interpretation of this, these things are not adding up. Like, why is that? Like, why, why did you decide to make those questions? Because you're just holding them accountable at that point. Like mm -hmm. you said, that you were going to make a decision this way and you're not. So help me understand why. Like maybe it is a simple misunderstanding or maybe it is like a deeper, deeper thing. Yeah. 
uh, hold people accountable, especially leadership. Mm -hmm. And then I, I tend to default to question everything, um, but that's just a career in advertising. Um, <laughs> It, it, so through through my experience, though, what I have found is that um, lofty, feel good mission statements, goals, and values can really serve as smokescreen for mm. uh, pretty toxic places to work. Um, in, specifically, specifically in advertising, it's it's really ego driven, um, and it, right or wrong, it just kind of is what it is. So you would experience a lot. I've experienced it and it's hard, you know, for me, it's always hard because it, when you say to Megan's points, like, this is what you say we believe in and that this is like the lens or the gut check on everything we do, but it's not. And so when you start to see little missteps, um, it can become, you know, hard at an individual level and you start to question and doubt. It's like, well, do they really care about any of this? And, and, you know, through, because of that, do they even care about me? Um, Chances are they don't um, at a bigger agency. <laughs> I'll just be blunt about that. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, it's a gut feeling and, and you have to decide, you know, you can do a whole pros and cons thing because there's plenty of people that have spent decades in advertising. And, you know, if you're able to set all of the BS aside and like just focus on your immediate team and do work, um, you'll be fine. But, you know, if, if you're really, and I think, younger students and soon to be younger professionals are actually going to start holding, um, you know, company leadership and executives mm -hmm. feet to the fire on these things. Um, because it's just, it's harder today to have smoke screens mm -hmm. and you can, you can just kind of start to, you know, read between the lines and see what's really happening. You know, at VML, it was, you know, it's like your career ambitions depended on like, one guy's mood in the like three minutes you might have in front of them the whole time you work there um and that's not <laughs> very encouraging or you know exciting to be like uh, a part of that and, and then because the truth is is when companies aren't held to these values it creates unequal playing fields and which is always going to exist I, mean, I was just saying like high school never ends um, people are clicky. People like to create their inner circles, and um, sometimes you are lucky to get in it. Most times you're not, um, but you can always progress and change jobs until you find that you mm -hmm. find that inner circle you can be in. Yeah, I think it's definitely important to look for fear-based decision making on behalf yeah. of leadership. If you can tell that someone's making a decision out of fear rather than maybe the bolder decision or the one that's actually right but is the harder one, um, that's another good good sign as well yeah, and i'll just add these conversations and these questions and this you know they don't have to be adversarial you have to come in ready to be ready to go mm -hmm. We're, approach it out of a curious a place of curiosity mm -hmm. and learning and that's something that i'm in learning and have learned over the last several years is just approach it from a place of curiosity in that genuine inquisitive nature so it doesn't have to be i mean and again be true to yourself you know if, if you're more of a person who's okay you know asking bolder questions and great but if not you know if you feel like you need to ask these questions just hey I'm really curious I wondered if we could sit down for five or ten minutes and I could ask you some questions and most people are gonna make time for that so mm -hmm. you don't be afraid to just approach it from a curiosity angle. Jack did you have a question? Yeah um, kind of uh, throwing it from a similar direction that you mentioned earlier in one of your responses right the, the point of view of the employer uh, and risk but I'd like to ask about the conversations to the job that you're moving towards. Mm -hmm. um, I've also had a career path where I've had a wide variety of roles, you know, as I, I think you all have too. Mm -hmm. And that sometimes comes up in job interviews. And mm -hmm. the risk from the employer's perspective is, is this going to, are you sure this is going to be a good fit? Mm -hmm. Are you going to stay? Have you had that come up in your interviews? And what's your strategy for that? Oh, yeah, I definitely have. <laughs> And, and I tell them that that is a benefit to their organization because I've been able to work in multiple layers of the working industry. And so this is actually a benefit, the fact that I've been able to see I'm bringing a perspective that others may not be able to that differs um, that will ultimately benefit their organization. And that's really how, how I look at it and saying that their risk is low 
if we can provide X, Y, and Z. So I'm very clear on what I need to be successful in a particular role and very clear with what I know I'm good at and what I know I uh, are the areas of opportunity, but what I just don't like doing. Like for me, I know paperwork. I cannot stand doing paperwork. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. So I tell my employers going in, like, if the expectation is that I keep up with paperwork and that's what you're going to hold me to the fire in, this is not a good fit for me. I'll tell you that. But if you want some change, you want a community member, you want someone who's going to advocate, then this is going to be great. And if you're okay with the paperwork, maybe being a couple weeks behind, then we can make this work. <laughs> this can be a great, but I'm very clear on, on those expectations and then showing that it's a perspective that that I've been able to see the sports industry, the higher ed industry, and all of the kind of benefits that I've learned along the way through each of those. And to add to that, I mean, it, if that's the situa situation you're in, my advice would be to package that up as your biggest selling point. Uh, you look at uh, Tesla or SpaceX, for, uh, for example, um, those organizations don't work in silos at all and anyone from any department can solve a problem. And in fact, they encourage that because they, they know the benefit of, yeah, I may not be ingrained and be an expert in this, but because of that, I may see a possible avenue to success that no one else could ever, could ever see. I mean, that's kind of the point of ad agencies, right? We provide perspective to our clients because they're so ingrained and have the blinders on of, I have to run a business day to day and there's just certain things I have to do where an agency comes in and we provide that fresh perspective, the, the ideas, the potential solutions that they would never think of because you just can get so ingrained and in close to something that you have permanent blinders on. Um, the software company I worked at, one of the, one of the executives, he was the general manager at the time. He was the general manager of like our payments processing product. And I was talking to him one day and he was just like this generalist. He basically, any role kind of from mid-level to executive level in a technology company, he had served. Um, and that, that made one, made him invaluable to the current organization he was with that truthfully, and he knows this, makes him invaluable to any organization that would potentially hire him. So to me, it's the biggest selling point um, if you find yourself in that situation yeah, outside of a specific skill set yeah. you bring to the table. Especially as a student, they want to see that variety of experience. And I never had anyone ask me like, oh, you've opted around a lot. It was like, oh, you've, gotten, you've been able to have so much experience as an undergrad. Even if it was like a six, nine month internship or job or whatever it was, they didn't really blink an eye at it because you're a student and things are changing all the time trying to figure out what you're doing. So I, I would say definitely play it up to your strength. Okay. Other questions? Chris, what do you got? Yeah, I have a question for you guys. So like after y'all started like your next job, how do you like immerse yourself into an organization with like new people? Like, <laughs> you're talking to like and meeting a bunch of new strangers and stuff. How do you get past that? So how do you get into the culture and how do you dive in and get a good feel for your new organization? Um, the best best experience I had in getting to know my new team was when I, when I started with Barkley in Kansas City. So my first two weeks was spent with my new team on a new business pitch. <clears throat> so in agency life, you have your day-to-day -day clients you work on, but because new business is the lifeblood of an agency, you're always pitching new clients. And that takes on, and Eric can probably speak to this, it kind of takes on a bigger degree of work. You're going to work late nights. You're going to work a couple weekends. But it's usually just for a week or two at a time. And it's a lot of fun. Benefit for me was, because I'm typically, I'm, I'm slow play with getting to know and getting comfortable with people. Um, but I didn't have a choice. Because of the nature of this pitch, I had to immediately, you know, start taking a deep dive and getting to know the people that I was going to work with uh, on a day to day basis. And when that two weeks was up and the pitch was over, we won and we went out and celebrated. And it was, you know, the camaraderie was like you know, 10 times what it would have been had the two weeks just been like me onboarding and doing a bunch of HR shit. Uh, so. so. 
Yeah, I think it's a very intentional uh, piece. For me, I like to do a 30 minute, like tell me what you do, tell me, tell me what you do here, what's your role? And then um, like, tell me what you like about it. I like to get to know folks of what their background is. Uh, I'm really big on being able to play to people's strengths. And so I, again, if a lot of times we talk about improving our weaknesses, like I really need to get better at X, Y, and Z. I'm kind of the opposite um, as an athlete. I'm like, you know what? I know I'm really good at this and I'm going to hone in on this and I'm going to get real, 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 real good at this. And then those other things, you know, maybe I can find somebody who can help me with that <laughs> or I, you know, hopefully I can eventually get somebody hired who can do the things that I know that I lack. Um, and so I like to get to know the people and what their skill sets are. So I know me, I can't stand event planning, but I know I'm going to have to plan two events in my role. And I know this. So I started to get to know the people in my office and I'm like, oh, hey, you're an event planner. OK, so guess who I'm going to and be like, OK, what do you think? I, who do I need to call for this and this? Let's just have a lunch meeting real quick. And so because of that, you're playing off of somebody else's strengths. And so they get to live in a zone that they love with you. And that creates a positive dynamic and interaction that you get to have. And so um, taking the time, I mean, it takes time. Like we have 17 people in our office, so we're relatively small. But 30 minutes, 17 times, that takes some time. So it's not just something that's done in like two weeks or three weeks. You know, it's over the course of, I would say, my entire first year but being, but taking the time and getting to know their background, what they've done, what type of education they have, um, it really gives you another level of respect for that person. And then you're able, again, to just communicate to them on, on a different level. And they respect that and, and turn around. And ultimately, they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, you need something. I got you. I got you. You took time to get to know me. Um, I'll, I'll have your back. I think the only thing I would add is, um, in my experience, really good managers will have a good onboarding plan for you. So beyond like the HR stuff, it's like the, I want to, I'm going to set up these meetings for you. Mm -hmm. A good manager will get those set up for you and say, okay, I, you really need to meet with this person, this person, this person, and then setting up time for questions and be able to say, I'm going to set this hour aside for you at the end of your first week. And I just want you to ask all the questions possible. Because mm -hmm. um, those questions are so valuable. And my most recent manager was like, that's the most critical time because you're questioning everything. You don't really understand how things are working. And so he really wanted to set up an opportunity for me to be like, what, what makes sense? Like we're a new organization. What, like, what do you see that's just like, you don't understand why we do that the way that we do. So keep an eye out for that. And you can ask for that too. You can say, Hey, can you make sure that I have a really strong onboarding plan when I come? Cause I don't know how to ask for reimbursement. I don't know how to, I don't know who to talk to about this thing or that thing. Um, so that's super helpful and it's really hard. I, this is my first job working remote completely and that adds a whole other challenge to it. So it's harder to get to know people. You can still do Zoom, but it's still, it's different. Um, but everyone's working remote too. So it's an added challenge, but the intentionality is so huge, like Ricky said. I'll just add a couple things too as well. Volunteer, uh, volunteer for stuff. And this is something that I'm learning about myself as I volunteer for things where other people don't. So. <laughs> volunteer if they're asking for someone to plan and help plan the company holiday party and you don't hate event planning. Yeah. Uh, volunteer. <laughs> I am on the, I am on the spirit committee. Yeah, we, 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 <laughs> volunteer or maybe there's a, maybe they're doing the corporate challenge or they're doing something for big brothers. Volunteer. Go do it. That's a great way to get to know people. Um, and then the other thing that I will say even if you haven't been there a long time, be the mentor. Uh, be willing to you know, hey, I know, I remember uh, when Jessica Newman, so several of you know Jessica came on our faculty uh, a few years ago one day, she's like, how does this wretched copy machine work? I'm like, well, I don't know much, but I can definitely tell you how to use the copy machine. And I showed her where our meager stash of office supplies were. So I felt like a little bit of a, of a mentor in that way. And she's like, oh, we have pens. I'm like, yes, there are pens downstairs. So, I mean, I don't know much, but I did know, you know, did know a couple things. So be, will, be willing to volunteer and be willing to share your knowledge. I think that's another good way to dive in. Really quick, adding on to the yeah. volunteer point, that's one I've had to be really careful about, especially as an intern. Because if you volunteer to be like, oh, I'll run and make those copies for you. I'll set up that Zoom meeting. Oof. Like, set some good boundaries and be like, that's not what I'm here for. Yeah. Um, I think that's that's really good. And I think I would apply that more to like, oh, we need to create this outline for this something or other. Like, something that is related to your job. Volunteer to do that rather than like the... I don't know, especially as women, I feel like we're expected to do like the holiday parties and things. And so I think just being wary of those things, if you love it, do it. But like also 
don't feel obligated because, you know, I don't know. I just think there's some good boundaries there that can be had. Oh, sorry, Chris, what? Yeah, yeah, and you don't want to be like the catch-all either, like, oh, Megan will do it. Like, yeah. What are some pretty clear red flags for um, employees going into a new company? Like, uh, you mentioned the smoke screen earlier. Is there a way that we can recommend that before going and starting a job, like in the interview process? Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the question is, you're going through, you know, you're, you're checking out a new opportunity, and you realize it might not be a good fit. What are some, some red flags you can look for? A green flag for me was when I asked, where can this organization grow? How can we, how can your organization do better? And it was a completely transparent and honest answer. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you know what, we've really fallen short here and they will tell you that too. And we've really failed in that area, but here's what we're trying to do better. And I think that's always been a really good question for me and just seeing how honest people will be and how much are they trying to sugarcoat it? Cause I think you can usually pretty easily pick up on when they are trying to do that. Um, so I think just look to see how honest and transparent they're being and then just how much they treat you like a human being rather than a, just another candidate too. Yeah, to add to that, it, it's one, it's hard um, mm -hmm. because uh, the recruitment process is their best foot forward at all times. It's smiling faces when you talk to other people you're gonna work with, you know, none of them are gonna have a disparaging comment to say because their goal is to hire somebody. Um, so it's hard, but to Megan's point, it's, you can ask certain questions, um, be it about the organization's future and their growth plans, um, but also uh, make it more personal about uh, your role within the company. You know, don't, and this is just always a good thing to bring up in interviews, like typically they're filling one role that does one, two, three specific things, um, but, we all know that you don't want to just go do one job with the same role for the next 15 to 20 years. So an easy question to answer is like, what's the growth or path forward from here? Um, and you can kind of tell, you know, if it's like, well, you know, we'll have that conversation down the road. And it's like, well, okay, so you obviously haven't, you, you're, you're just trying to, you know, get someone in the door right away. Um, you know, I mean, I've heard at VML, I heard, overheard an executive creative director. And again, advertising gets pretty cutthroat and busy. And he literally said, it, you know, basically he said, I don't care if we have to fire them in six months, but we need to hire somebody right now. So red, there's a red flag. I mean, <laughs> you're not going to, you're not going to know that or hear that, but you, there are organizations that sometimes they just need bodies to throw time at something, you know, and agencies specifically, like we bill our hours. So, um, but yeah, the, the more personalized you can, questions you can ask regarding your place with that role within that company and growth potential, I think that'll start to give you a, a good peek behind the curtain. Yeah, in an interview, I always ask, uh, you know, at the very end where they're like, do you have any questions for us as the, the folks that you're interviewing with or one person? And I always ask, what's your favorite thing about working here? I always ask that because if it's if it's like crickets and people are like, that, that tells me a lot. That tells me a lot. Oh, okay, well, mm, I don't know what my favorite. Wow, that's a hard question. Right, exactly. And so then, then thinking about their response too, if it's, you know, well, we get paid really well. You know what I mean? Like you have to think about like how they respond in that or, and if, and if their answer suffices to you, you'll know, you'll be like, okay, this is a good working culture. Now, again, you do have to be a little leery because again, this is the best foot forward. And so I always take it a step further if I feel like the answer is, is, a good one. And I'm like, okay, cool. I, I, if they say, for me, if they say the people who I work with, the team that I work with, I'm like, perfect. This is going to be great. Then I usually will hop on LinkedIn and probably find someone who had worked mm -hmm. there. And I'll just reach out on LinkedIn and be like, hey, I'm applying for a position in this role. And I'm just really interested in your perspective um, as to when you worked there. Mm -hmm. Really quick. And LinkedIn is a great way to connect with people just blindly. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Um, and people will respond. I have not had one person not respond back to me and let me know their real in-depth feeling <laughs> <laughs> about yeah. working for the organization. And then I was able to then decide like, okay, yeah, I can handle, you know, some tips over here. I can handle X, Y, and Z. This is a good opportunity for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that- you can always lean on like Eric and then Eric knows a lot of people in the community and he would oh, say, yeah. um, hey, I'm applying for this job. Any red flags that you see, past students that have worked there. And the the decision to go is still ultimately your own. But it's always helpful to know going in, what's the full picture? Um, I know know several people who have worked at different places around town. Um, And and like if Eric doesn't know, he'll probably ask someone and be like, "Mm, is this place good or is it bad? So always ask. And I have a call later today with someone who's interested in a job with Lead for America. And she's like, hey, I just want to know more about the culture. 15 minute call with her later today. I think that's coming more common. Yeah. Glassdoor.com. Oh, yeah. Um, but you kind of have to take that with a grain of salt, you know, because. The types of people that are putting right, in are negative, like really disgruntled uh, employees. Neg- yeah, are like disgruntled really employees are going to be the loudest. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. You know, but if you see, again, advertising, you see an agency that has like all five, you know, just blowing smoke up uh, your rear type of reviews through it's, you know, one, it's probably coming from the leadership. Um, you know, so that's. That that can be a resource too. Um, there is an app again if you're interested in the advertising advertising industry called Fishbowl. That's where you can kind of really get the down and dirty on on agencies. So uh. um, the other thing that I'll add is take advantage of being a student. Most mm-hmm. professionals, especially in the general Midwest, I am a Wichita State student. I wondered if I could buy you a cup of coffee and ask you some questions for 30 minutes. You may have to bug them a couple times just to get on their schedule and try a couple of different means of communication, but you would be surprised how many doors and how many very senior level mm-hmm. doors you can get in. You know, I was a state student. I am curious. I wonder if you could help me. And especially, like I said, around around here, that and as Megan mentioned, she's doing something like that later today. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, not not hard at all. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask our panelists one final question, and then there will be time if you want to come up and, and say hello. Uh, but in, in the interest of being respectful of, our, of everyone's time, I want to ask, how can change be a positive? Or how has change, some of the changes that you have made in your careers, been a positive for you? Ooh. Yeah, I love change. Because <laughs> uh, if I didn't, then I'd still be riding a horse and buggy to get to work every day. <laughs> I wouldn't have a cell phone or a computer. Um, it's all in perspective. And I think that that is uh, an entity for a lot of things, right? So it's your perspective and how you're looking at it. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be challenging, whatever, whatever way we want to describe it. Um, as long as you take a positive outlook into it, there's, there's a silver lining, a red lining, there's a gold lining, whatever your favorite color lining is, um, <laughs> to just about anything that you can possibly do. And so if you think about, okay, this, this opportunity to change or do something different is my growth opportunity. It's gonna put me in a different position to be able to affect or change or, or um, have more impact or earn more money, go on more vacations, buy more, X, Y, and Z, live your best life, whatever the case may be. There, the change, it happens, it will happen, and it's whether you decide that you want to take a positive outlook on it. Yeah. Ch- change is learning, change is growth, change is investment, change is betting on yourself, change is inevitable. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So I love that, Ricky. It's, it, and it's good. Um, it, it, and changing often is good, depending on the industry you're in. You know, there's this kind of parad- or the paradigm shifts started to happen. Um, you know, my dad would give me a lot of grief. He's like, Oh man, you're changing jobs again. You know, and this is a guy that's worked for the same company for like 30 years. Mm-hmm. And so there's this kind of dinosaur of a thought of, Hey, you go work for the company until you die or the pension pays out. But that's from an era where there weren't that many, jobs or opportunities as there are now and a lot of that's thanks thanks to the internet and the digital tech technological world we live in and so when you see and in fact when you see how quickly change change comes in technology if you as a professional aren't trying to match that change and that's that doesn't necessarily mean changing jobs but maybe it's changing roles within a job Mm -hmm. or a company but 
ultimately keeps you competitive, um, ultimately can give you a competitive advantage. And I've experienced it. It's, it's perspective. I've seen advertising done every which way it can be done. And you kind of get a pick and choose. Like, I like that way, and I think it's the most effective. Um, but, yeah, like, change is good. And it, kind of the last thought I would say is, like, don't feel bad about uh, leaving a job, even if it's a job you like. Right. If it's a better opportunity, like, yeah, don't feel bad about growing. I mean, in fact, I would encourage anybody for the first five years out of college, you know, 12 to 16 months, just start looking for a new job. Um, don't feel bad. Leave well. And just be honest. It's like, hey, why are you leaving me? I have a good thing. I was like, well, I want to see how it's done somewhere else. I want to learn. Um, because I've worked with people who have been in the same place for 16, 20 years in, in advertising. And every now and then, you're going to have those folks that still have their edge and still bring a lot to the table. But then there's other folks that you can tell. It's like, oh, it's obvious you've worked here for 20 years because you're you only know how to do this one way. And, and there's not a single right way to do anything in this world. There are some obvious wrong ways, but um, my advice is just go learn as many right, good ways as you can in whatever field you're in. Mm -hmm. I received, I, mm, yes, I think change is great. Yes, I'm gonna agree with that, <laughs> absolutely. And I think uh, there was such a physical reaction for me too. Like I feel so much more excited. I feel, I have so much more energy when, when you feel like your path is in alignment. Like when you feel, when you follow that gut feeling, you're like, oh my God, I feel like I could conquer the world because like it, you just know you have love for what you're doing. You know you're in the right place. And then what's so interesting is you keep getting these signs that you're in the right place. Like I'll give a really quick example. My very first day, my boss gave me my list of fellows and said, this is, um, you know, who they are, where they're from, where they're, where they're at and like what they're working on. And there were two fellows that really struck, well, three fellows that really struck out to me. One was in Kalispell, Montana. There, I don't know very many people from Montana. I'm from Montana. And my, I was just like, oh, my God, I know Kalispell, like, <laughs> of all the places. The second one was one in Huron, South Dakota. Of all, Again, of all places, it's like 12,000 people. My aunt, uncle, and cousins all grew up there, of all places. And then the third one was um, a fellow in San Luis Obispo. And my brother passed away about six months ago. And that's where he lived before coming to Wichita. And I was just like, oh, my God, like, the signs that you're in the right place will just keep you going and keep you jazzed. And you honestly start to look out for them too. Like you're like, oh my God, I just feel so much better about this. And um, so I totally agree. Change is good. Take the bet on yourself and don't make decisions out of fear because it won't get you yeah. where you want to be. Yeah. And really don't feel bad about leaving. I yeah. think that I think so many times we guilt trip ourselves into staying mm -hmm. into a situation that we don't like. Um, but realistically, the engine will keep going without you. So, I mean, if you were put in the ground tomorrow, they will have uh, someone replaced in your role. And that's just because that very quickly. And, yeah. and, and I think that was a realization for me. I was working super, super hard and someone passed away in a role. And I was like, Oh, and they had the interim named ASAP. And I mean, and that's, and I understand that like by way of business, you have to do that. You have to keep rolling. But something, like you said, physically within mm -hmm. me was like, yo, that doesn't make sense to me. I don't know that. I don't know that I'm okay with that. And that switched my entire perspective. I was like, okay, yeah, I'm not here to work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay? I'm not here to work. I go to work. Yes. Mm -hmm. But there are other things that I will be doing. So if I want to be in Disney in July, <laughs> I'm going to be in Disney in July. I'm checking yeah. on you in June right? and making sure that okay? this is happening. I'm just saying, yeah. like, yeah. so remember that. Don't feel bad. Don't, yeah. don't feel bad. The the entity will continue. <laughs> There's a big difference between in, invaluable and irreplaceable. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and that being, you can be invaluable to your team and your organization, but the, the cold hard truth is, is that nobody is irreplaceable. Mm -hmm. um, Great stuff. Uh, quick announcement, and then we'll thank our panelists. Uh, so make sure that if you haven't, uh, stop by the table outside. We've got swag, we've got t-shirts, we've got bags, we've got stickers. Uh, the t-shirts yeah, were all go designed by table. Shocker Adlab, one of our I want this black one. Class. This little so black class. Go Shocker Adlab. Uh, we have got delicious. sessions today at Maybe. 11 and like 12 a grocery 30, thing? so stick yeah. around or come back. Yeah, we we also have sessions at 9, 30, 11, what? 12, 30 you know, tomorrow. Let's give a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe some cheese. So, Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you all. <laughs> Have a great day. Come say hi if you wish. And uh, come join us for I know. You're the cutest one. This is adorable. Hello. I'm on your Yeah. <laughs>